Hello there. Welcome to the Saroy channel, wherever you are in the world. And so much love to each and every one of you. How are you doing? I do hope you're doing marvellously well. And don't forget to follow the rules because you need to go and spoil yourself. Get yourself an effervescent sparkling drink because I've got a fabulous story for you tonight. But before we get started, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Click the notification bell and the thumbs up. And let's get started with tonight's story. Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners, Me and my brother Seth were as thick as thieves. Sometimes I thought we may as well have been twins, as people invariably always thought we were, given the fact that we looked uncannily, prodigiously alike, with only a year's difference between the two of us. We were both cute-looking kids growing up. Even I have to admit that, when I look back at family photographs. Even my wife says, No! No, that can't be you, Huck. He's way too adorable to be you, which I take with a pinch of salt as my wife is not the kind of woman that tells you what you want to hear. But I do admit, I was a sweet child. My mother had Italian ancestry further down the line, I believe, and it had inadvertently influenced our physical appearance in a positive way. We both had jet black hair, as dark as a raven's feathers. It was thick, voluminous, shiny. It bounced around our face in a sea of untamed, undulating curls. We had sparkling hazel eyes framed by the thickest, longest eyelashes and a slight olive tone complexion, with dimples on our cheeks and what my mother would describe as the sweetest-looking cherub-like faces. She would say it was so hard even to get remotely angry with us, as when she tried to correct us for our bad behaviour, she always felt she was disciplining a couple of angels. Even though me and my brother Seth looked so disproportionately alike, we were very different personalities. But somehow we managed to complement each other, rather like pepper blending harmoniously with salt, and tomato ketchup enhancing the taste of crispy French fries. We worked symphoniously together, like two orchestral musical instruments, in a congruous alignment, you could say. I would describe my brother Seth as stoic, strong, prudent, steadfast, loyal, and always calm like the rocks that I'd see gathered around the creek. But I was much more like the frenzied water, dashing recklessly over the rocks, throwing myself impulsively at anything I thought invited excitement and intrigue. Growing up, we lived in an indestructible Colorado farmhouse, which was as pretty as a picture. Some described our house as poetry. It wasn't too large, nor was it too big for us, but it was perfect for our needs. And not the typical American-style farmhouse you'd expect to find here in Colorado but more like something you might find parked elegantly in the Scottish Highlands, among the rolling green hills there. I suppose this was not altogether surprising. Our house was actually built by a Scottish sheep farmer, who moved to America in the 1930s to marry his all-American wife. He insisted in building a home that rather reminded him of his birthplace, so he employed tough materials like stone, wood and brick in his building construction. Let's just say our house was almost as tough, durable and robust as the rippling contours of the mountains that ebbed and flowed in the furthest distance, anointing the sky in a hazy, ethereal distinction, with a pronounced rugged but majestic intrusion that invited appreciation and intrigue on all eyes that surveyed the prepossessing views our property encompassed. Our square farmhouse was painted all white, it was a single story with a basement and attic made from stone and brick, with thick, sturdy, almost cast-iron walls and a grey slate roof, along with dozens of symmetrical windows that eagerly embraced spectacular views. It seemed so comfortable in its viridescent setting, almost as if it had always belonged there and had never been apart from the earth. The ground floor of our home was symmetrically arranged, with wooden skirting boards, dado rails, timber doors with architraves, timber shutters and cornices, and substantially sized fireplaces. Growing up, me and my brother always gravitated towards the woodgrove on our land. I suppose that wasn't surprising for two young boys. It drew us to it like iron filings to a magnet. The woods were magical, mysterious, dreamy, and could easily harness a young boy's imagination. The real world faded in the background for us. You could become anything you liked in the woodgrove, in this treasure trove of opportunities 
and the world's boundaries that hemmed you in on every side would come tumbling down. As in the woods, anything was possible. Me and my brother Seth would become cowboys, Indian warriors, or cops and robbers, and even strange monsters or dinosaurs that we would create in our imagination, of course. One day sticks out in my memory, above any other day. It was early spring. The sunshine was audaciously pushing its way through the sky, so the colder weather was subdued, and for the first time in a long time it was actually warm. For two young boys between the ages of ten and eleven, me and Seth needed little encouragement. We dashed eagerly towards the wood, with a passionate eagerness and a zealous enthusiasm, followed by our rambunctious chocolate Labrador Chloe, whose tail was wagging profusely as it thumped the ground. She was possibly more excited than we were about this spontaneous adventure. She loved nothing better than pinning her nose to the forest floor and picking up unusual scents that would keep her occupied forever, as she'd lift up her legs to anoint everything with her pungent scent. The forest invited us into her depths, almost as if welcoming back two old friends. It was like the tall vertical pine trees, from the log poles, the bristle cones, the Colorado blue spruces and the Douglas firs that penciled up into the sky like verdant Christmas trees, were whispering to us as their needled boughs jiggled in a cool breeze. Welcome back, Seth. Welcome back, Huck. It felt as if the forest itself was hugging us effusively. I used to love the smell of its carbon and hydrogen-rich terpenes that infused this woodland oasis in a plethora of sweet, sharp and refreshing notes. I remember me and Seth bounded eagerly towards the creek. We watched the powerful, thunderous water thrashing over the rocks. We began to gather stones on the side of the creek. We loved throwing rocks into the water, watching them skimming the surface and sinking to its dull, murky depths. And that's when Seth calls me over to him. Come here, Huck. Look what I found. By the side of the creek we discover an old passport. It's covered in dirt, buried beneath the pine cone litter and the rich earth. Not only is there a passport, but credit cards and an old wallet containing over three hundred dollars in notes, along with a couple of old leather shoes that look so weathered they're almost breaking apart. There's an oversized old sweatshirt that's lying beneath the folds of bracken, with a round logo on it that reads the Red Fox. I cautiously open the disintegrating discoloured passport that almost crumbles in my hands. I see a middle-aged man in a photograph and the name in the passport reads Ferdinand O'Reilly. I think we should leave everything here, says Seth, but we'll take the passport back to show Mother. My mother's in the kitchen. She was making homemade yoghurt on the gas hob, so she was warming up milk in a saucepan, and in another pot she was simmering some strawberries in a sugar syrup. The kitchen smelt sweet. My mother looks up at us and smiles, while Chloe greets my mother with excited, whimpering squeaks as if she's not seen my mother for decades, when we've only been away from the house for a few minutes, but then that's dogs for you. Back again, she says, smiling. I thought I wouldn't be able to drag you away from those woods with the spring sunshine out like this this morning. It's a beautiful day out there, not a cloud in the sky. What brings you back so soon? You're not hungry already. Look what we found, Mum, I say. It's a passport. I hand it over to her. She switches off the gas hob to turn her attention to the sodden passport, her curiosity now titillated. My mother opens the passport and reads the name out loud. Ferdinand O'Reilly. Where did you get this passport from? She asks incredulously. It was by the creek. The wallet is still back there with three hundred dollars in it. There's a couple of old shoes and a very large sweatshirt buried beneath the dirt. But on our property, says my mother, that's extraordinary. I think I'd better call the deputy sheriff. He needs to see this. My mother was close friends with Paul, the deputy sheriff. They'd been to school together years back and had even dated in junior high. She taps into her cell phone. Hi, Paul, it's me, Rita. Look, I'd appreciate it if you popped over for a moment. There's a cup of coffee and a chocolate brownie in it for you. Look, I've got something significant to show you that I think you might find rather interesting. Tell you what, I'll be there before lunch. I'm holding you to your promise, Rita. I'm looking forward to that chocolate brownie very much. Me and my brother are listening out for the deputy sheriff's truck to arrive. We're eager to know what he will say about our curious find.
Soon we're rewarded to the sound of hardened tyres crunching pebbles beneath the circular folds of rubber. The truck breaks, the engine switches off, and like a lightning strike, me and my brother literally rocket out of the house, followed by the exuberant Chloe, whose excitement has increased on sensing our obvious enthusiasm in seeing the sheriff. The sheriff looks so impressive, with his smart cowboy hat that graces the top of his head. How are you, Huck, and how are you, Seth? he asks us cordially, greeting us with a bright, warm smile. Fine, sir, we say. My word, I don't normally get such an excited reception when I go anywhere, he teases. I think even the wife runs and hides from me when I get home. But you boys, along with your brown lab, treat me like royalty. I should come here more often, and I'm looking forward to your mother's chocolate brownie. I have to say. The sheriff is a handsome man. He's athletic and lean, with blonde hair that licks the back of his shoulders, and investigative Prussian blue eyes that are always alive with interest. Paul is the kind of man that questions everything, and will notice the small details. When he enters the kitchen, the first thing he says is, It smells like strawberries in here. That's right, Paul. My mother laughs. Trust you to notice that. If you must know, I've been making strawberry yoghurt. Smells very nice indeed, says the sheriff. You should teach my wife, Rita, how to make yoghurt. The sheriff's eyes dart around the kitchen, like a sagacious ferret, observing everything, missing nothing. Where is your old fruit bow? You know the one you used to have? The sheriff asks, as he notices that the old fruit bow has now been replaced by a new one. I mean, who notices things like that? The sheriff does. It broke, said my mother. I opened the dishwasher. It had broken into two halves. It happens, says the sheriff, with the winter temperatures that we had a week ago. I imagine an ice-cold bowl being exposed to warm water in a dishwasher. Well, it's easily going to break, as China can become quite brittle. Never thought of that, said my mother. That's probably exactly what happened. Before I prepare you your tea and brownie, Sheriff, I think I should show you this. The kids found it. She hands the passport to the Deputy Sheriff. Where did you find this? he asks, opening the passport very carefully, to examine it closely. I intercede hurriedly, dying to get my words in. Seth found it, I tell him. It was by the creek. There was also a wallet there with three hundred dollars in it. There were credit cards, various IDs, and a pair of old weathered shoes, along with an oversized dirty sweater, which had the name Red Fox on it. How curious, says the sheriff, raising a quizzical brow. He reads the name. Ferdinand O'Reilly. The sheriff sits up in attention. This man... I know his name. He was reported missing over two years ago by his wife, who claimed her husband walked out after a little spat they had. He hasn't been seen since. The question is, what is his stuff doing around in your woodgrove and by that creek of yours? It is odd, says my mother. I mean, if his shoes were found lying by the creek, and that creek is quite deep, it makes me wonder if he tied something to his feet and drowned himself there. I mean, let's face it, his wallet contains over three hundred dollars. He's clearly abandoned his money, his ID, his credit cards, his passport. You can't get far without those things. And why are his last items of value found basking under the forest debris by the side of our creek? I mean, what are they doing there? The sheriff rubs a large hand reflectively over his day-old stubble that graces his chin, giving him a rugged appearance. That's a very good point, Rita. But maybe that's what he wants us to think. People sometimes deliberately leave clues like that. So we assume they drowned or met with a fictitious accident because they want to disappear and be assumed dead. It does happen, you know. So you're saying that this was a setup? I'm not suggesting that, Rita. Not at all. I'm saying when it comes to missing people. You can't simply just jump to conclusions like that. We'll get a police diver to search the water. I'll notify the wife about the items we found. I hasten to say their farmhouse is not very far from yours, so he could have walked to your farm and hidden in your woodgrove. 
The wife did claim that his backpack and camping gear were missing, which she hoped meant he was out there alive somewhere. But this recent find will give her pause for thought, and it will of course make her fear the very worst. Of course, it goes without saying we'll have to search the Woodgrove for any signs of human bones being scattered across the earth or eaten by wild animals. I don't know what to say, says my mother. I do hope you don't find his body, Paul. I hope he's just bogged off into the sunset to start a brand new life. I can't bear the thought of someone being so down on themselves they'd consider taking their own lives. But surely a spat or an argument with his wife wouldn't bring out such grievous melaconia, so much so that he'd end his own life by suicide. Depends, says the sheriff, removing the hat off his head and bouncing it in his hands like a bull. The one thing I've learned about being a deputy sheriff, Rita, is that people are enigmatic, and sometimes the littlest things can push them over the edge, so that they do silly things that in the cold light of day... They would have never dreamed possible. Did you ask the wife what the spat was actually about? My mother asks curiously. The sheriff takes a bite of his chocolate brownie, wipes away the crumbs. Delicious, Rita. You never disappoint. Your brownies are ace. Why do the bakeries in town not get them like this? He pauses for a moment. I think she said the fight was over a Staffordshire Bull Terrier, but she didn't seem to want to go into detail about it. She became somewhat bashful, but she said he did leave the house in a very distressed state of mind, and told her he never wanted to see her again, as long as he lived, that she disgusted him. Wow, that's pretty terrible. Why would he say that? She must have done something bad. My mother raises a brow. Wow, that's steep. I mean, what could his wife have done that sent him right over the edge like that? It must have been really bad. I mean, I've had my fights with Bill over the years, as does any married couple, but I've never spoken to him like that before. And if I did, I guess I would almost certainly mean it. You're right, says the sheriff. Something smells really off about this. We just have one question. What happened to Ferdinand O'Reilly, known by his wife and by his friends as Fern? A day later, our farm had become a hive of buzzing, bustling activity, with observant policemen studiously combing and probing the woods for any clues, and a punctilious, pedantic diver was recruited to exploratively search the creek for any signs of a body. But everyone came back empty-handed, along with an industrious, unwary police cadaver dog that found nothing. It was a day or so later, a strange truck, a red Ford Ranger Raptor, rolled down our driveway. My first thought is that this was a strange vehicle that I was certainly not acquainted with, as all my mother's friends and their trucks I was familiar with, but not this one. Me and my brother, who'd been rambling around the countryside on our bicycles, quickly propped them up against the old stable block that was used for storage and hurriedly ran towards the strange car and its unlikely occupant, as I was possibly even more curious than the deputy sheriff would have been. The woman had parked her car right next to my mother's in the parking bay. She was staring out of her screen window vacantly, as if for a brief moment she was miles away, locked up in her own thoughts. She seemed to compose herself as she reluctantly climbed out of the truck, jangling her keys in her hands, throwing them into her purse. For a while she doesn't even notice me and my brother or even our brown Labrador, who is whimpering with excitement to see the stranger, but I'm holding her firmly by the collar, so she doesn't go jumping over the poor woman. The woman is wearing black pants, flared at the bottom, a black watch jacket, and a white cotton top with a black bow around the collar, tied in a ribbon. She's wearing flat court shoes. She looks up at us briefly, as if inadvertently against her own wishes. She's been flung back into reality. She looks at us with a sorrowful pair of bare light brown eyes, running a hand through the salt and pepper crop of curls that she has in a pixie haircut. I'm looking for Rita Florentino, she asks inquiringly. That's my mother, I say. Come this way. She's in the kitchen. Chloe dashes up to the woman to greet her, but she literally recoils in horror at my dog's zestful enthusiasm. So I quickly restrain her on the woman's behalf. Chloe, get back here. 
Leave the nice lady alone, will you? The woman nods at me gratefully while she follows me into the kitchen. She walks with a straight back, a rather graceful deportment. Sorry, she says. I'm not very good with high-energy dogs. I'm always rather reluctant, very scared that they'll knock me over somehow. Before long, the woman is seated around our kitchen table, having tea with my mother. My mother has always been remarkably good with people. My father always tells her she should be a therapist, as she can make the most closed-up person just open up. You can mention someone in town, and my mother will offer up scraps of information about that person that you never knew about. She will randomly spout insane, mindless pieces of information like, Did you know Mrs. Wallace grew up in a haunted house when she was a little girl? And her grandfather's ship was nearly torpedoed in the Second World War. My brother and I would look at each other incredulously. Where did my mother get all this information from? We soon realised that she can open up the most unyielding nut that won't break open easily without being pounded and hammered first by a sturdy, robust nutcracker. My mother just taps the nut with her fingers and it breaks open like that. It seems on this occasion that the somewhat aloof, not exactly over-friendly woman, is opening up to my mother seamlessly. I hang around in the background to eavesdrop. Now is the perfect time to give the rambunctious Chloe a grooming. Must you do that in here, sweetheart? says my mother looking at me disapprovingly. You're only going to get Chloe's hair all over the kitchen. But it's cold out there today. It's warm in the kitchen, I explain. My name is Greta O'Reilly, the woman tells my mother. My husband's stuff was found lying around your creek in the forest, she says, taking a sip of my mother's hot tea. She lifts the cup to her mouth, her fingers trembling. The cutlery shakes. Oh, I am so sorry, Greta, says my mother, reaching out to give the woman's arm a squeeze. It can't be easy for you, having to learn about all that. But the good news is that nobody was ever found. So your husband may well still be alive. The woman begins to cry. Salty tears spill down her face like raindrops. My mother hastily brings out a box of tissues, which she slides towards the woman. She gratefully grabs a tissue, blowing her nose rigorously hard in its folds. In truth, it would have been a relief if Fern's body had actually been found and recovered in your creek. At least there'd be some closure for me. It's the not knowing. It's the not knowing that's killing me. It's like I can't fully grieve him. Because I don't know if he's alive or dead. My mind is all over the place with worry and I just can't get on with my life. How can I move on when I don't even know what happened to my husband? I can imagine, says my mother. It's the not knowing. That's the worst thing of all. Growing up, I had a cat that just vanished. It was gone for days and days. We never knew what happened to it. But there was so much speculation. It was eaten by coyotes. It accidentally drowned. I remember I just felt as if I was in limbo, not knowing what had happened to my cat. I admit if I'd found her deceased body and been able to bury her, I would have moved on so much quicker, reached a place of acceptance, but always wondering and hoping that one day she would reappear was so gut-wrenching for me. I'll never forget that. You do understand then, says the woman eating my mother's words gratefully, as if they brought her a measure of reassurance. "'Was your husband depressed?' asked my mother. "'Is that why he left your home?' The woman begins to sniffle. She blows her nose again. "'Have you ever done something you really, really regret? "'Something you wish with all your heart you could take back and do differently? "'But you know you just can't, and there's nothing you can do about it.' "'Of course,' says my mother. "'Haven't we all?' I don't think there's a person on this planet that has not done something they regret. It's called being human. We all make mistakes. Well, I did something, something really, really bad, that I know that Fern could never forgive me for. That was the reason he stormed out of the house that night, with his backpack. He looked at me and said, Rita, I don't know you any more. The woman I loved would never have done something so cruel. What you have done makes you a monster in my heart. 
How will I ever be able to forget this? I hope that I never see you again as long as I live. And then he left in his truck, which was found parked in town, with the keys still in the ignition. The door was unlocked. What did you do that was so bad? asked my mother. I am almost ashamed to tell you, lest you should judge me too. Quite honestly, I wouldn't blame you if you did. You know what it's like here in northeastern Colorado, especially here on the eastern slopes of the mountains, in spring and summer. Let's just say there were dreadful thunderstorms and hailstorms so big they looked like golf balls. Our Staffordshire Bull Terrier Woof Woof was just so traumatised by the storms. She would scratch the furniture viciously, pound at the doors, desperately trying to get out. She'd cower under the furniture, was in a dreadful state. She was so frightened. I tried all kinds of remedies to calm her down, but nothing appeared to work. So I took her to the vet to have her put down. At that revelation, my mother becomes silent. I was secretly so appalled. I stopped brushing Chloe's back as I shook my head in disgust. I could understand why Ferdinand had walked out. I'd have done exactly the same if my wife had randomly put down my best friend like that. How could the woman have done that? Surely something could have been done to tranquilize the dog. I'm sorry. I couldn't get my head around this. I know. I know exactly what you're thinking, and honestly, I don't blame you. Yes, I overreacted, says Greta. My husband loved that dog with all his heart. I never told him about my plans to put the dog down. I just knew he wouldn't take it very well. But I had no idea he would take the news so badly. I've never seen him so angry, so indignant, so devastated, all at the same time. You've killed my best friend. How could you? How could you? And not telling me about your intentions is a thousand times worse. It's cruel. Of course, I defended myself. I should have taken complete responsibility for what I'd done, but I didn't. You've got to admit it, Fern. Woof Woof was in a dreadful state, I told him. We had to do something about his angst. We couldn't leave him like this. So your solution was to kill him, was it? I'd hate to see what you'd do to me if I was in a bad way. Throw me to the wolves, toss me over the boat to be eaten by the sharks. I don't know you any more, Rita. I'm ashamed to call you my wife. What happened to the kind-hearted girl I married and fell in love with? What hardened your heart like a stone? That's what I'd like to know. Oh dear, oh dear, says my mother. He did take it very badly. I can't say I blame him. Losing a dog isn't easy. It sounds like Woof Woof was his beloved companion. You know the saying, don't ever come between a man and his dog. What's wrong with me? says the woman cradling her head in her hands. Why did I act so impulsively? I broke my husband's heart. And even if he hates me forever, all I want to know is that he's all right. Then I'll be able to sleep at night. Of course you want to know if he's all right, says my mother. Of course you do. I am terribly sorry about Woof Woof. You clearly are too. But it's all water under the bridge now. The main thing now is to find your husband. That's why I came here today. Do you think one of your kids could possibly show me where his stuff was found? Of course, says my mother. I'm sure that both my sons would be only too happy to show you where they recovered the stuff. But I want to assure you, the police did search the Woodgrove thoroughly. And let's just say they found nothing. I know, but I just want to go there for a moment. It'll give me some peace of mind. It'll help me to feel close to him. A year later, it was one night in early summer. Me and my brother retired to bed. We shared a bedroom together, even though we could have our own rooms. But we chose not to. We enjoyed each other's company and didn't like the idea of being separated by different bedrooms. Sometimes we would lie in bed at night, talking together for ages about everything and nothing. Those were the days. Me and my brother slept in the bedroom at the far end of the house. As far as we were concerned, that was simply the best, most private room in the entire house. It was spacious, airy, very large. But it was far away from the main bedroom where my parents slept, which was a huge plus. The thick walls of our home meant we could be quite noisy and our parents wouldn't hear us. So I always clandestinely thanked God for those thick insulated walls created by the Scottish builder that seemed almost soundproof, so any of our loud antics 
from our pillow fights to playful wrestling, could not be easily heard or discerned. I wonder whether that poor woman, what was her name, says Seth, Greta O'Reilly, I wonder if she ever found her husband, or whether he's still missing. I doubt he found her. I think we would have heard something by now. I'm quite sure Sheriff Paul would have told Mum if there was any news on that front. You know what I don't get, says Seth, why that woman put down her husband's Staffordshire Bull Terrier, just because he was afraid of thunderstorms. There's got to be a way for treating that condition. We don't know how bad it was, though, do we? I say. Come on, Huck. There are always ways to treat nervous animals. Veterinary science has come a long way. Surely there are ways to medicate dogs under stress. If my wife did what she did to her husband, I'd also walk out. But do you think Mr O'Reilly might be dead? I ask Seth. I mean, we found all his stuff scattered near the creek. I mean, think about it, bro. How far can you get without money? Well, if he's not dead, then where is he? asks Seth. Do people just vanish off the face of the planet for no reason? Well, maybe he deliberately disappeared, I say. I mean, remember, Sheriff Paul says it happens when people choose to start their lives all over again. I asked my brother curiously, What made you think about Mr O'Reilly all of a sudden? I don't know, said Seth. It's weird, but over the last week, I thought of little else. I keep thinking about him and what happened to him. Seth yawns. He closes his eyes. I must have followed shortly afterwards. It was much later that night when I found myself being shaken violently by Seth. He was pushing me quite abruptly. Suffice to say he was the only light sleeper in our house. I groan. Please, Seth, not now. I'm really tired. Whatever it is, can't it keep till the morning? Seth continues to shake me. Hack, Hack, there's someone outside the bedroom window. A and whatever he is, he's very big. I'm scared to look again. You see, something was tapping the window just now. I did pull back the curtain briefly. That was when I saw him. He had the biggest face I've ever seen. Oh, my God, Huck. I nearly had a heart attack. I got such a shock. I think he's still out there. What should we do? Oh, for goodness sake, Seth. You're such a baby. It's probably nothing. You can hear there's a slight wind out there. And the oak tree behind us is always banging against the eaves. That's what you heard. You probably saw a shadow. Listen, says Seth. Can you hear it? Sure enough, there was a tapping sound at the window. I begin to laugh at Seth. I know he's got an imagination on him. When he was little, he was terrified there were monsters hiding under his bed. And even his school teachers always applauded him for his creative, overactive imagination. I didn't doubt that the sound we were hearing was banging from one of the boughs of the oak tree. Seth had now conjured up a huge face in his imagination, like he did when he was younger. I enjoyed the fact that out of the two brothers, I was the brave one that was not as prudent as my brother. No, I was the one that grabbed the bull by the horns and faced any situation head on, whatever it was. I climb out of my bed with a cocky swagger, putting on my bedside lamp and staggering over confidently to the bedroom window, pulling back the curtains. See, there's nothing there. And then I do a double take. He's over there, says my brother. Can't you see him? He's looking in at us. I'm now in a state of bewildered shock. A soft showering shafts of moonlight, along with the outside light that is motion activated and clearly has been triggered by this creature, enhances my vision. I'm able to see the tall, dark figure very clearly. It looks like a monstrous humanoid giant. I could tell he was eight foot tall, about seven hundred pounds, with a pyramid-shaped head that folded seamlessly into his shoulders. We both shout out the word Bigfoot at the same time, looking at each other incredulously, hardly daring to believe what we're seeing. What was a Bigfoot doing standing outside our window, peering in at us like this? The creature presses his flat aquatic nose on the window, and that's when we see his eyes. They seem intelligent, benevolent and kind. He's indicating for us to follow him, pointing earnestly towards the woods. We're filled with an overwhelming sense of urgency, as if we need to follow this creature. 
He wants us to follow him, says Seth. Do you think we should? I mean, I've heard horrible stories about Bigfoot's being aggressive. I ponder this thought for a moment. If he was aggressive, then he'd be displaying aggression towards us, would he not? I think we should follow him. He seems nice. I get the feeling there's something important he wants to show us. We indicate to the creature that we will be following him. We quickly throw on windbreakers and sneakers and pad discreetly through to the kitchen, where Chloe is lying in her basket next to the range. She looks up at us eagerly, her ears alert, her tail thumping. You stay there, good girl, I say, as me and my brother slip out of the back kitchen door, closing it discreetly behind us. Chloe barks a little. I know my parents will easily ignore her. She always barks at the wind, and there's quite a feisty wind brewing tonight, so they won't easily be roused from their slumber. The Bigfoot is waiting for us with an expectancy. She seems very troubled, very aggrieved. Her face under the moonlight shadows is so human that all my reservations and fears abandon me at once. I feel a curious connection with this incongruous idiosyncratic creature. To look at, she's quite terrifying. If you were observing her in an abstract way, basing all your perception on her physical, lofty, rather majestic appearance, it would surely make even a grown man tremble. She is dauntingly intimidating, built like a brick shithouse, excuse the terminology. Yet this Bigfoot has a gentleness about her that you sense immediately. It's like she's swathed in a warm kindness. Imagine meeting an aggressive breed of dog that rarely intimidates you, based on the breed's reputation. But he bounds up to you, wagging his tail, greeting you so affectionately that your inhibitions are thrown to the wayside, and you respond in kind, greeting the huge dog lovingly, as its demeanour is so warm. It was no different with this Bigfoot. He exuded warmth, compassion, kindness, intelligence, and empathy. In some ways, he had more compassion than some humans I've known over the years. To be fair, I've never been in the woods at night, so we were ever thankful we'd brought torches along with us. As let's not beat around the bush here, within the tall groves of trees, it was a wee bit menacing. The woods at night had always struck me as unfriendly compared to during the day, but at night they almost become bodefully airy, inauspicious, as if during the witching hours they morph into a different place altogether, as if portals from different worlds open up and purge out the spirits of the undead to haunt the woods. It didn't help that the tall, baleful silhouettes of the trees that plundered the murky sky were clustered together like uncongenial gangsters who had an axe to grind with us. Well, that's what it felt like anyway. Their needled boughs shuddered under the brisk nudges of the wind that whistled through the trees. It felt as if they were conspiring against us and whispering to each other. I could almost swear I heard my name being called. Hack, hack, hack. Obstensively, the tuneful sounds of the crickets and frogs was abolished on this night. They certainly would have offered us a measure of reassurance. The whole forest was steeped in a spooky, oppressive silence, apart from the moaning wails of a capricious wind. But the clawing, claustrophobic sound of the silence left my hair standing on edge, and a nauseous feeling swamping the back of my throat with a repungent, bitter taste. Our sneakers crunched the forest debris, while some of the rugged terrain, precipitous in its upward ascent, with jagged rocks that were embedded within its slopy contours, seemed to trip us up in the darkness. On one occasion I fell over, and the male Bigfoot reached out his hand and pulled me back onto my feet. I remember my little hand felt like a doll's hand in his huge sausage-like fingers. Before long we came to the creek. That was when we saw a pop-up tent blowing in the wind. The Bigfoot reaches up to something in the branches, pulling it out. To our astonishment it's a hangman's knot, that is often called a uni-knot, with a noose at the end of the loop. The Bigfoot points towards the tent and guides us to an oak tree with an extended branch. I suddenly understand what the Bigfoot is telling me. You mean there's a man in that pop-up tent over there that's trying to kill himself by hanging himself on the tree? I ask him. The Bigfoot nods his head, as if he understands my words. I hear in my head the words, Sad man. Needs help. You help. I immediately take the noose and enter the strange man's tent with my torch. The man wakes up with a start. He looks astonished. I recognise his face at once. Oh my God, it's the face of Mr. O'Reilly, 
I'd recognise it anywhere. I'd seen that face in a passport photograph. The man is alive. What's he doing in our woodgrove? Why did he try to hang himself? I lean out of the tent and whisper to my brother, It's Mr O'Reilly. Go call Mum and Dad quickly. Who are you? says the man, who looks as dishevelled as a homeless man, and smells ripe. Now he sports a very long black beard. You're Mr O'Reilly, aren't you? Good to meet you, Mr O'Reilly, I say, reaching out my hand to shake his. How do you know who I am? We found your passport, your staff around the creek a year ago. The police were here on the property looking everywhere for you. You created quite a stir. They even had a diver searching for your body in the creek over there. Was that why you left your stuff here? So people would think you were dead? You wanted to run away? Something like that, son. What, are you Columbo or something? Something like that, I say. Do you realise your wife was so upset when you walked out on her? She came to the woodgrove here to be close to your stuff so that she could feel close to you. She was so, so sad. Well, she's got over me quickly enough, has she not? said Mr O'Reilly angrily. I was coming back home yesterday to surprise her. I wanted to see her again. I missed my wife very much. When I walked down the drive, I saw a strange truck parked in the driveway. My wife was entertaining a man in the house, having wine with him. She looked like she was having a very good time indeed. Don't think she was missing me very much. I may only be eleven years old, Mr Riley, but I even know that your wife is entitled to have some fun. For all she knows, you're as good as dead. You're the one that abandoned her, not the other way round. What did you expect? For her to join a nunnery or something? What are you doing with that rope? says the man. Give it back to me. It's mine. That bloody Bigfoot snatched it away from me. That creature was so annoying, yakking on and on at me in this strange, peculiar language, as if telling me off. What bloody business is it of his if I kill myself or not? Why would he give a toss? I thought Bigfoots didn't give a damn about humans, but he's one big, interfering busybody, watching me like a hawk all the time. I know he's trying to stop me, but if I want to end my life, he can do nothing about it. So, Mr. Riley, is that what this is about? You're going to hang yourself when you discover that your wife appeared to be with someone else. Is that it? None of your business. To cut a long story short, my parents persuaded Mr. O'Reilly to come back home to have a bath and a shave, while my mother surreptitiously called Mrs. O'Reilly to tell her that her husband was back. She said she'd be coming over at lunchtime the following day. She had something very important she needed to do first. We were rather bewildered by that. Why was she delaying seeing her husband? But when she arrived at our house, we knew why. I'll never forget how Rita and her husband held each other so tightly, as if they were never, ever going to let go. They were both crying tears. Who is he? says Mr O'Reilly. The man you were with yesterday. Just a good friend, sweetheart. There's never been anyone else but you in my life. Surely you know that. I could never, ever replace you. But where have you been all this time? I've just been hitchhiking around America, but I missed you. But I still struggle to come to terms with what you did to Woof Woof. I'm so, so sorry, sweetheart. I wish I could take it all back. I was a complete idiot. I wish I could reverse what I did. But on that subject, I've got something for you back in the truck. Just you wait over there while I go and get it. Moments later, she reappeared with a tiny little Staffordshire Bull Terrier puppy in her hands, with a blue bow around its neck, and a little card which said, I'm so sorry. He's yours, she says, putting the Staffordshire Bull Terrier into her husband's hands. I just hope he's not afraid of thunder. Looking back on everything that happened that night, I know that the Bigfoot alerted us in order to stop Mr Riley from taking his own life, because he was so devastated about what he thought was his wife having an affair. I'm glad to say he and his wife are still very much together, very much in love, and they now have a Staffordshire Bull Terrier that's not at all afraid of the thunder. So there you are. That's my story. Wow, what an incredible story. Until next time, goodbye and good night.